Barry and I have been working together for, I guess, close to 15 years uh, trying to map uh, drain tiles. And his research rationale is that up here in the Midwest, you guys have 31 million acres. Tennessee, we don't have, well, we have very few, but Midwest, you're blessed with a lot of water, and you have to get rid of it, so get to drain. Uh, the research rationale also is I understand that sometimes you lose your maps. You have, you have drain tiles, and you don't know where they are, and you've got to go back, and, and you're going to try to find them. Uh, and other research rationale is environment. You have something there that, that may be a cause of pollution or it might be some sort of regulations you have to deal with. So you have to know where your tiles are. Now, the way that's uh, traditionally been done is using a tile probe. I've never used a tile probe to find drain tile. I have used ground penetrating radar, and I map cemeteries, and I have used one of these tile probes to map graves with all day. It is not fun. So I, this is not the way to do it, I don't think. <laughs> Uh, the other way that I understand that you do it is you have to excavate. And in excavating, you kind of tear up your field and you rip up a, a drain line you have to repair it. So that's, that's understand. These, I understand these are two ways you don't want to have to do it. So Barry had the idea of using remote sensing to find the tile drains. Now this is an old noggin, sensors and software ground penetrating radar. It's about the size of a lawnmower. You just push across the ground. It injects ground penetrating radar, radar into the ground, you reflect off of it, and you can see the tile. And he was uh, quite effective with this. The ground penetrating radar, they're around um, 20,000, 30,000. And he's, he's done some farm research with the device, and he was able in certain locations to find the drain tile, pushing this lawnmower-like machine back and forth across the field, didn't have to tile for it, found the drain tile. Now, what he found out, Yes, you can use ground pin trade R, but sometimes you can't. And that's because lots of times it's affected by the soil type. If you have a wet soil, if you have a clay soil, radar doesn't work. Radar works best in dry sand. <laughs> okay. And then you have uh, you, Yes. And then you have you have antenna frequencies that you have to deal with. We we've computer processing, tremendous amount of computer power have to do this. Uh, if you have what perched water that masks the tile from the radar, uh, the surface characteristics, uh, the pipe diameter, uh, the smaller it is, the harder it is to see it with radar, the deeper it is, the harder it is to see it with radar, and so forth. So, in order to get a handle on this, Barry and I switched to a golf course. Now, we're in the wrong business. I spend my summers in the middle of a cotton field. If I want to take a vacation, I go to the middle of a soybean field. Doing research on a golf course, uh, the people who do drainage work on, on sports turf, they have it made. There are no copperheads, no rattlesnakes, fire ants. You don't have that stuff here. We have ticks, uh, armadillos, all that. You don't have to worry about that on a golf course. You have an indoor plumbing. You have a restaurant. You have a nice <laughs> – none of this you have in a cotton field soybean. But also it is a, it is a structure that's been manufactured pure sand and you know the dimensions and all that you just go across it and you're in as far as gpr is concerned when we go to gpr conference this is gpr heaven if you do drainage work any sort of drainage work on sports turf whether it be a golf course um, football field soccer field baseball field gpr that's the way to go we got very good at measuring very very good at doing sports turf this is the way to do it. And what really kicked it in was in the beginning when you used GPR, you used a wheel encoder to track it back and forth to find your location, to find the tile. That wasn't very easy, so we switched to GPS, differential GPS, which was sub-meter. And so you're mapping tiles sub-meter, which wasn't very nice. When we coupled it with RTK and had sub-centimeter resolution, it was nice. That, we had some beautiful maps. You actually see the tile in three dimensions. You could, you could see them as pipes underneath the ground. So, again, if you're doing sports turf, drainage tile, GPR is the way to go. However, when you try to ramp that up to field production, to the farmer, 
and you're looking at a 500-acre field, a 1,000-acre field, I've done this. It's not locating tile. It's trying to locate earthquake fissures underneath the field. And I'm facing a 500-acre field with an ATV. I've got to do 10-foot transects. I, no. <laughs> you're just pulling this thing back. And forth. No. And then it's not only that, driving this, but the data that you have together, and it's the post-processing, all that data, processing it back and forth. And so when we tried to ramp it from sports field to the production field, it really didn't make sense. I guess if you had enough money, you had enough processing power, enough to buy the equipment and a bunch of antennas and have a rail, maybe it could work. But it really wasn't the idea that, uh, that was going to kick in. So we are looking at some fields to try to map, and we got on the Google Earth. And there are times when you get on Google Earth and you look at your farm, you can see your drain tiles. I don't know if you've noticed this. There, there's a clock up there on the top of the toolbar, and you can go back in time. And it may not be your farm, it may be a neighbor's farm, it may be the next county over, but you can see the drain tile. Okay. And then sometimes you can see it, sometimes you can't see it. Sometimes the field next to it you can see, same the same rainfall, you just can't see. So what's going on? And so we figured it must be timing, the time of the year, some, something's going on. And so have, rather than having to rely upon a commercial photographer flying back and forth and posting this up on Google Earth. By the way, if you look at your farm and you can see your tiles in Google Earth, you've, you've got it made. But if you can't, what happens if you, can you fly it? Now we have this drone, it's fly on demand, just fly the fields, map your, map your drain top. Now, here's some examples. Uh, Barry and his, and his uh, research group spent, I think, last winter looking at all the data that they could find, all the aerial photography they could find. Here's some examples of drain tiles, different counties. I guess these are in Ohio. They jump right out at you. The right time of year, you can map them just from aerial photography. But sometimes you can't see them. Also, you got to use some common sense. Sometimes when you first look, you say, "Oh, there's some drain tile," but they're really not drain tile. So you just you got you got to know the space, and you got to know if they're draining to the common point. This is where the drainage experts say can come in and say, "No, that's a tillage practice. That's drain tile." So you can't can't just jump because you got parallel lines that it's automatically a drain tile. Down in Tennessee, we're using UAVs for remote sensing. I'm sure like everyone up here is doing. Uh, we're doing them, using them for replanting decisions, nutrient deficiencies, insect disease detection, uh, drainage issues. We don't have fields of drain tile like up here, but if we have a wet spot, we might drain it out. Crop insurance claims. That's the biggie now. UAVs doing crop insurance claims. You fly your field, have photograph, have damage, you have photograph, crop insurance. That's, that's the big thing going now. Variable rate application, application crop inputs, yield estimation, soil, vegetable, moisture, water. all this. We're generating these uh, red is bad, green is good maps. We're trying to put some sort of sense to the red is green, red is bad, green is good maps. Our fleet of copters that we have down, or aircraft that we have down in Tennessee, we have the quadcopter, and this is probably the most inexpensive way to get into UAVs, but it's not the way to do it on the farm. Uh, we have a very large quadcopter. The battery is the size and, of a brick and probably weighs the same amount as a brick. The, the blades will take a finger off. But this thing is, this is not a commercial unit. I mean, this is not a homeowner hobbyist unit. This is a very commercial unit. The, but a copter can do vertical takeoff and landings. Not a big deal in Ohio and Tennessee. We have tree lined fields everywhere. You gotta have, go up and down. Don't have a nice landing area. You have ability to hover over a spot. You have limited flight time. This is the big drawback of the copter. Very limited flight time. Difficult to fly. Requires fully automated flight features. It requires more maintenance than a, than a fixed wing. But it's relatively inexpensive. Somebody gets into UAVs, they probably start off with a, with a copter. But if you're doing ag work, you have large acreages, you got a map, and you got to map them fast. 
the fixed wing is about the only way to go. You're not going to do it a copter. Uh, we're using the uh, Ag SenseFly. They have another model out. It's a larger model that's just for agriculture. That maps even more acreage. Uh, you launch this thing. You got to throw it in the air, and it's going to come in and land. So you got to clear the clear the trees. You don't have this problem here, but down in Tennessee, we've got to clear the you know come in and it does a belly landing. It has a longer flight time and cover a lot more area. It's, again, it's very difficult to fly if it's not automated. I could not fly these things by hand. I'm a licensed commercial drone pilot. I could not fly the, co the copter or the UAV by hand. It's totally automated. You program it on a computer, you throw it up in the air, and it flies a, a flight plan and comes in for landing. You can hit a button, tell it to do an emergency land, that's about it. Uh, it has minimal maintenance, but it's very expensive. Typically, the, the fixed wings are very expensive. This is a flight that I did in February. I was trying to map some cold soils in February in Tennessee. It was 72 degrees that day, so I didn't get my cold soils. Uh, this is the flight pattern. It's 135 acres. We did it in under 30 minutes with a fixed wing. This is a thermal camera that we're flying, measuring heat. It's not a, a visual camera where you see these snapshots where in this flight you might have 700 or less individual photographs where thermal is almost continuous. And so it took 7,000, over 7,000 photographs with thermal. Flying at 100 meters, and it just it did this flight pattern, 135 acres. You guys, I noticed you guys have buzzards around here. <laughs> this thing looks like a buzzard. If you throw this thing up, and there, it looks just like a buzzard. It's up at 100 meters. It's black. It's got wings. There, there's time I'm supposed to track it, and sometimes I'm tracking a buzzard. I'm not tracking the UAV <laughs> back and forth. It looks just like a buzzard. The way this thing works, in order to, it recreates the photograph. It doesn't take photographs and, and kind of cuts them and tries to fit them together like a crossword puzzle. It actually recreates a photograph, a synthetic photograph. Every, pic, every pixel in that photograph, that green dot that is a, just one pixel in that photograph, it looks at all the other images and finds a similar spot in order to regenerate that pixel. And so you have also a very, you have very high resolution data, it's three dimensional data, and you pretty much know its location because everything is GPS oriented. So it's fairly accurate in its location. The thermal camera that, that Barry and I are using operates in the infrared. Some of you that use uh, multi-spec cameras uh, are in the near-infrared. Near-infrared is great for chlorophyll. Uh, we're up in the infrared, which is heat. And heat images different than visual. The camera, the thermal map camera, fits in the back of the drone, and it's pointing down. Thermal is different than visual. On the left is a visual image of a man. Notice he's got his hand up in a plastic bag, and look at his glasses. Okay, the glasses are transparent and visual, and the plastic bag is not transparent. Where over in infrared, when you're measuring heat, the black bag is transparent, and the glasses are, are opaque. You can't, can't see through the glass. So whenever you're interpreting thermal data, it's different than visual data. Again, this is us flying, same 7,000. Each of these dots are created, the computer creates it from all the photographs, looking down. Another thing that's interesting is this it's, doesn't have a gimbal. Lots of times you'll see a quadcopter with a, with a camera that's got a gimbal that rotates back and forth to try to have the camera always pointing straight down. The SenseFly does not have a gimbal. It's, it's doing this. But it also has an autopilot that knows its orientation. And it's storing that orientation into the header of the image. And so when the computer 
does the processing, it takes that image that's tilted and flattens it out. Okay, so it takes it in software, it flattens out, you know, has it going straight down instead of off in an angle. It also repositions. It takes all the images and their GPS, GPS locations. That, okay, the GPS header says I'm here, but based upon my calculation, I'm really here. And so it reorients the photograph and repositions the photograph. And then it takes the data in the photograph and then pixel by pixel regenerates a new image. On the left is a thermal image, and on the right is the visual image. The left is the thermal map camera, and on the right is an RGB image from a Sequoia. Some of you might have used a multi-spec Sequoia camera. Uh, notice you have shading here. That's because this area is on a slope, and so you're not getting the reflected heat from the sun coming direct at the camera. It's a bit kind of being angled off. Now, if we just block this out, it would normalize that and we could see better. But it just for the entire photograph to be seen, this is image. What do you see? We're in the upper left. I don't know if I have a, there's not a pointer on here. Uh, this is a four-lane highway, and you can see the heat. So this is late in the afternoon, and so the asphalt is heated up, and so it's radiating thermal energy. This is a gravel farm road. It's showing up black, saying it's cold. There's a white spot here. That's a F-150 truck engine running. Uh, what else is in there? But you, this is a, I don't know if any of you go to the Milan Field Day, No-Till Field Day. This is the parking lot for the Field Day. And these are research plots. That's, this would be in soybeans, soybean stubble. This is the last field that we mapped. This would have been, let's see, the end of February. And this is a research area, 135 acres, soybeans, corn, and cotton residue. Just the residue. And this is thermal. Again, you have shading up there at the top. That, that's because it's at an angle from the sun, so it's not getting reflected radiation coming back from the sunlight. Uh, the gravel road is showing up dark, meaning it's colder. See these white spots? Anyone? We didn't know what this We had to go back and ground truth that. What, it didn't show up in the visual image, but it's showing up here. This is where the research associate was doing the harvesting of the plots, and the, header, the soybean header got clogged up, so he had to lift the header up, and it's, he said it was four to six inches of soybean stubble. Standing soil being stable. Okay. So in thermal, residue is hot. I guess in, in farming here, you, you know that the, the residue on top cools the ground beneath. Whenever we, we went to the field and we would rake away the residue, there was a 10 degree difference between the top of the residue and the cooler soil beneath. Okay. So. What we're, what we're seeing here is thermal is an excellent way to map residue. If there's any, I mean, near infrared does chlorophyll. Thermal is an excellent way to do residue in the early spring. And what you're seeing, all the white is residue. This area here is not harvested. It's just mowed grass. It's out of production, so just kind of mowed grass, what you're seeing. Now, why are we using thermal <laughs> instead of visual? We're mapping visual also, but we're also going to be using thermal. Our theory is that water absorbs heat different. Wet soil absorbs heat differently than dry soil. So in the morning hours, when the soil is warming, dry soil will warm up faster. Wet soil will warm up slower. So the wet soil will be colder than the dry soil. So over the top of the drain tiles, you catch it just right, Top of the drain tile will be warmer than the side of the drain tile. Right there. Now it may flip at night when you have a cooling trend because the soil on top of the drain tile will cool faster than the water. The wet soil will cool slower. So we may see the negate of it. That's our theory. 
That's what we're trying to work on. A uh, little bit of satellite. Uh, he wanted me to mention that Illinois State, Jonathan Thine, uses uh, SWI shortwave infrared imagery on satellites. And what he's doing, let me see if I can get this right. He has imagery of very dry soil. And then after a rainfall event, he significant rainfall event, he waits three days and then compares the data. Now, if there has been a change, which means the soil remains wet, it was dry, it was wet, it stayed wet, so you saw a change, it means it wasn't drain. It's not an area that's been tiled. If there's no change, so it was dry, you had a rainfall event, it drained, it went back to dry, it means high, high likelihood it is drain, a drain field. And so he has this scale where the purple light shade on the left is not drained all the way to the right, which is gray, which is definitely drained. So this, this is the way that they're doing at Illinois State on trying to map drain tile fields, not individual lines, but just the fields.